Well, I mean, if one thing I've always wanted to do as a delegate is to give a voice to the voiceless. And I'm a former prosecutor. I was a prosecutor in Virginia Beach. And so um, the, the thing that kind of haunts you when you've been a prosecutor, you know, as I, I said on the floor, they give you a lot of training in law school, but the law, they don't train you how to do, do grief counseling and um, you get an enormous amount of sympathy for victims and their families. And so I felt like as I sat in the courts of justice committee, which heard the death penalty bill. And then again, on the floor, I was hearing a lot of testimony about uh, the reasons why we should abolish the death penalty. But the one word I was never hearing were victims. And so I felt like it was important to um, give a story to those victims that somewhat are forgotten in this whole debate. And I got to be honest with you, uh, going in in this 24 hour deep dive, as I did just reviewing the files, and I still have some friends in law enforcement, I was able to get some information it was by far the most gut-wrenching experience reliving this journey with we these are if there's there's one word to describe what happened to these victims it was cruelty that's the only way to describe the way they they the way they died was just abject cruelty by every definition and so i wanted to give a voice to those victims and you know hold up their photos and i'm sitting in my office i still have them um here in my office and quite frankly they're a little haunting uh, reliving all that, but I, I also know it's important for them to be heard as we debate this change in Virginia. I mean, you know, right here, I mean, this is Stacy Reed, and Stacy Reed was 16 years old, and she was murdered by a white supremacist because he, she, he suspected she was dating an African American, and so he showed up at her house, he tried to rape her, she struggled. Uh, the police report showed she struggled. He stabbed her repeatedly, murdered her. And then after he murdered uh, this 16-year-old girl, he didn't leave the house. He just sat in the living room. He got an iced tea, lit a cigarette, waited for her 14-year-old younger sister, Katie, to show up. She showed up. He forced her in the basement, first forced her to see the body of her dead sister, and then forced her into the basement, uh, raped her, stabbed her five times. Uh, multiple times, thought she was dead, by mir miracle she lived, but then, you know, this monster of a defendant, Powell, he taunted the family from jail and sent a, a very graphic letter to the prosecutor, basically saying that you either, I know you want to kill me so bad because he wanted to get out and kill everybody in the country that that was um, non-white. I mean, he was a monster, There, and, and, and the cruelty of it all, and so um, when you go through that, I just felt like it was so important because the one thing missing in this debate, in my opinion, uh, John, is, is that the death penalty is not about vengeance. It's about ultimately the ultimate crimes uh, giving out the ultimate punishment because there's just certain crimes in which the facts of the case are so horrific and so horrible that you can't think of of anything other than the fact that this, the, the, the depravity of this case, the facts of this case is so horrible that it, it warrants out the ultimate punishment. And, and that's what it's about ultimately is, is allowing those used to be juries, now judges, allowing ju judges to have that if they make that decision that the facts are so heightened uh, in that case that it's, it's, it's warranted. Well, I mean, I think right here is Stanley Reeves. He was a 33-year-old Norfolk police officer. He was um, shot by somebody on death row, Mr. Porter. He, and while he was struggling on the ground trying to live, Mr. Porter stood over his body and executed him. He was a cop killer. Uh, the, the victims on here, this is Treva Gray. You know, Treva Gray was the wife of Ricky Gray. Uh, he, without going into graphic, beat her to death before he killed on six, six more people. Um, and these are people that, it, that, that, you know, the victims are of all, all backgrounds and all ages. Anthony Juniper is on death row right now, um, killed a two-year-old daughter in her mother's arm, executed the mother, executed the brother, stabbed the four-year-old, and then point black range, murdered the two-year-old daughter while she was in her mother's arm. So I think the idea in all of this is this, the death penalty is rarely used. There's only two people on death row right now uh the, huh juniper and reporter right and i think that's 
that's because violent crime has gone down largely in Virginia because we've had things at truth and sentencing and we have things like parole, but you got to realize a lot of that's going away now. And if there's anything I could stress to the people here, that may be watching this interview is <clears throat> when you and I hear life without the possibility of parole, when I hear life without the possibility of parole, that means the person doesn't get out. But that doesn't mean that anymore in today's Virginia. I mean, Gregory Joyner, who this is Sarah Jameson, she was 15. She's 15 years old. He strangled, raped and murdered her, buried her in a shallow grave. And he was given life without the possibility of parole. Two years ago, the parole board said he has a history of violence. Don't let him out. They just let him out. Gregory Joyner is back on our streets. And so he's still in his 40s. He gets to spend the next 40 years uh, enjoying time with his family and Thanksgivings and Christmases. And Sarah Jamison never even got to celebrate her prom. And so you can't get around the fact that life without the possibility of parole doesn't mean that anymore in Virginia. Uh, because our criminal justice system has changed and is changing. <clears throat> we just today, right after we voted in the death penalty, we also voted in the mandatory minimums for drug dealers, even drug dealers that that it's their second offense dealing drugs to kid, kids, not their first. It's the second time that they've dealt drugs to kids. And we, we just abolished mandatory minimums for drug dealers. So um, <clears throat> maybe some Virginians think that will, this will make us safer. I don't. I think I think the statistics will prove this out. And I guess my frustration is everything that we're seeing, a lot of what we're seeing right now have advocated by this governor, uh, we tried before. These were reforms that were tried in the 1970s. They led to a crime explosion. It's exactly what we, we are going to be seeing. Um, they say that the only thing you learn from history is that people don't learn from history. Uh, all of these reforms have been tried before and they lead to an uptick in violent crime. And, and um, ultimately you could have Virginians that are gonna be victims because somebody that otherwise should have been behind bars is gonna be back on our streets. Um, and you know it's very, very difficult. The whole debate today on the death penalty is very difficult. I was talking to a colleague of mine in the house, uh, Rob Bell, who said that the, the cheers from Red Onion Prison where the death row inmates are being held, the cheers from Red Onion Prison can be heard all the way to the grave sites of these victims. And that's the, that's the awful reality of, of uh, in my opinion, what happened today is the victims were forgotten. And I think that's really unfortunate.